talk to us a little bit about how you look at financial freedom, which I really label as the ability to do whatever you want, whenever you want to really have full control. Have you achieved it? Or is that a goal that you're personally working towards? Yeah. So I just finished my book called Work Optional, which hasn't been published yet, but it's going to be over the next month. So what I wanted to do, the part of what I do for a living, which is wealth management, this word retirement is so tired. It's so freaking mm-hmm. tired, right? It's so mm-hmm. boring. It's so archaic. Yeah. Like enough's enough with this idea about retirement. Enough's enough with saying, I'm going to retire because my cousin retired at 65. Or I'm going to retire because I'm going to get social security at 62 or full retirement age, which is 66 or 67, depending on how old you are. Or I'm going to get my pension, you know, which is really not the case many times going forward, but some people do. So some people wait for a specific age based on a certain income stream they're going to, to achieve. That is complete, completely ridiculous. We changed the word and retired the word retirement and named it work optional. So when I speak to people, yeah. clients, prospects, it's all about when, at what point of your life is work going to be optional, right? But what does work optional mean? Well, work optional means that you're at the point where you have enough assets saved, real estate investments, businesses that you have that are generating cash flow that you could be able to maintain the exact lifestyle you have as if you were in your working years. So maintain the same exact lifestyle, but you got you got cash flows, passive income streams coming from various sources that are giving you the luxury to stop working if you want. That's number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, maybe you want to continue working because you enjoy it, but you know you can stop working because you saved enough and you have enough passive income. Or three, maybe you work part-time or in that industry or consulting job that you always want to do. The bottom line is, is when you're in a work optional lifestyle, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. And and that's that's what we all need to be strive for. So, you know, fortunately, when I launched my own business three years ago, I'm 46. If I sold my whole entire business today based on everything, I could make work optional for myself. I happen to love what I do. Three young boys, you know, 13, 10, and nine. You know, God willing, they take over this business one day and I have a multi-generational business that runs through for multiple years, which is a personal vision goal that I have. So I'm not ready to stop working, but yeah, the idea of work option is lifestyle is really what it's all about, Steve. Yeah, it's so true. The work optional is such a better word than retirement because most people aren't really looking to retire. A lot of people love what they do. They just want to have the ability to decide for themselves what they want to do in that given moment or chapter of their life. So I love that description. Let's talk a little bit about how you got there. Let's talk about how you actually got to this point of being in a position to be work optional, to have the option to exit your business and do whatever you want. Obviously, you're in a position where you're running the business. You like doing that. I can tell that's the strategy that you've used to create income. Talk to us a little bit about how you go about making money in that business. And then let's talk a little bit about some of the strategies that you're using as well to be able to start creating passive income for yourself so that you can be optional while you're doing that. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of business owners, exactly like myself, a lot of our money gets reinvested back into the business. And that's been the case for 22 years, 23 years. So it's not like we take our income and invest in a portfolio, which I do with any retirement savings that I have and some some after-tax extra cash flow that I have gets invested just like I invest my client's capital. But a majority of the money that I make gets reinvested back into the business. Again, that's always been the case. So the return on investment capital that I get in doing so has been tremendous if I were to sell the business today and if I was to factor in how much I put into the business, right? So the return I get on my capital annually, right, is is extremely high versus what I'd be able to get in stocks, real estate, or private equity, which are those three. Well, private equity is essentially what I have, which is a private business, right? So there are three ways that people can really grow their money over time. One is through stocks, two is real estate, three is, is private equity, right? Or owning a private business. So the biggest part of my net worth is in my practice. So to answer your question, if it came to work option for me, it would have to be selling my practice, taking that capital, yeah. and then investing in in various investment strategies like I invest in my clients and taking a distribution from that portfolio to live on for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. It makes so much sense, right? Because so many business owners are just like you, right? 
they leave the the career world of working for somebody else. They go start their own business. They hang their own shingle and they start building that income flow. That's quite active, right? Running a private equity business versus investing into a private equity business is very operationally heavy. It's taking your time, your yeah. likeness, your ability to come on this show and be able to share your lessons is part of what it takes to run that business. So a lot of people they keep investing into their business because majority of the time you're going to get the best ROI for the dollars that you reinvest in your business because they're connected both to an investment you're making plus the time that you're actually putting in. So the dollar per hour that you get out of that is going to be way higher. And this is why it's so valuable for people to get to a point where they might want to hang their own shingle. They might want to go out and start their own business because the dollar per hour they earn invested into that business is much bigger. And then of course, there's the option for the exit. The downside is if you do that for 15 or 20 years and everything's tied up in one asset, you're not well diversified. Diversification isn't everything. It's important to invest and focus into one thing. But talk to me a little bit about at what point do you think it makes sense for people to start pulling some of that money out and start investing it into either traditional like stocks or into alternatives like real estate and PE that can then start building other income streams alongside their business. At what point should somebody start considering doing that themselves? What I was going to say to you before is the the risk that I have in other business owners is the, the idea that you're investing all this capital into your business. And yes, it's working. The business is growing. But if one day, all of a sudden, for some reason, through technology, the wealth management business went away. I don't believe that's ever going to happen. They've tried many times. I think that personal touch is what people want. So my belief is that I'm okay with still investing in my business because I feel like the wealth management space is here to stay for a very long time, but you still never know. So if all of a sudden the value of my business went to, was, you know, cut in half for whatever reason, or 75%, that's problematic. And your whole point is, well, how do you figure out how much should I, if I have a dollar, do I put it all in my, because right now every dollar I make after tax or before tax, because anything I get back in the business is, is deductible, right? Yeah. How do you figure out or what makes the most sense as your question is asked? And it's a tough one because I do have, for my case uh, personally, is I believe so much in a wealth management space and where it's going. I only think it's getting larger and larger. Yeah. That for me, you know, ever probably 60, 70 cents on a dollar is going back into the business. And yeah, because of that, I'm seeing really good growth. I don't think I would advise that for everyone. I do think yeah. you know, 30, 40 cents on the dollar should get invested in, you know, stocks, real estate, private equity, again, because they're the best performing asset classes over time. Nobody can dispute that, right? Mm-hmm. And 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 do that as your safety bet in the event your business doesn't work out. You need some type of fallback, right? So yeah. that's what I that's what I would recommend. If you're really conservative, it depends on your personality. I mean, there is no doubt, no matter how you slice it, people get to where they are in life. The super super wealthy is through mm-hmm. concentration. Yeah, whether it's yeah. concentration in the business, concentration in real estate, concentration in single stocks, one, two, or three, or if you're or executive at a major publicly traded company. They became wealthy because of their stock. The wealthiest people in the world today is Bill Gates, one of the mm-hmm. wealthiest, right? Buffett's the other yeah. one, most wealthiest guys, and, and Munger. They own you know, personally like three or four stocks plus their Berkshire Hathaway. So yeah. concentration is important, but concentrating in a smart way is even more important. And that's kind of what I am doing, um, and, and I have confidence in going forward. Well, I think that makes so much sense. And especially when you're kind of early in the development of a business, you want to reinvest everything. I've been doing real estate for nearly a decade and and I started with with no dollars in the bank, negative, and was able to build millions of dollars of net worth uh, through this process of continuously reinvesting. Some of those investments didn't pay off. Maybe you spend a couple hundred thousand on marketing and it, it doesn't work out or you hire somebody and it doesn't work out. But in the long run, you're always going to get a better return on investment investing in your own business. It's only after a certain point of time when it starts to make sense for you and your specific situation. And I know you help people go through this planning process and it's something we're very passionate about because what I've found is that me personally, I was so 
focused on building this business. Everything was about the exit. Real estate doesn't exit for five or 10 years. And majority of my income is based on the success of those deals. So the change that I made personally was to start focusing on creating passive income for myself. And that's really where Name Your Number was born out of, because I realized after investing in my business so long, it's, it's time to actually start creating passive income that's outside of it. What's great in my business, I get to do both together. And it sounds like you are probably in a very similar situation because your, your hands are so connected to that. Um, I want to get into your personal vision of what you're building, and then we'll come back to talk about how you can actually kind of create a plan that kind of fits your life. So tell me, what is that vision of the life that you're creating? You were in a career for decades. You started your own shop. You're serving tons of very successful, wealthy people. What is the vision that you're you're creating for you and your family? What does that look like? How do you want to spend your time? And, and why is it so important for you to be focused on this? Yeah, I'm going to answer that in two seconds. Just want to go back to concentration. Make sure your audience understands this, right? You got to make, I said, it's smart concentration. Yeah. Concentrating in Bitcoin is stupid. Concentrating yeah. in cryptocurrency is stupid. Concentrating in speculative investments is stupid. Taking 5% or less of your capital and going into those areas, that's okay, right? I still wouldn't agree with that, but that's okay. So yeah. make sure, and that's why I'm saying, if I constantly repeat, if you're going to concentrate, it's got to be smart. I agree. So the vision for what I'm, how I think about everything, right? So the, the reason why I left the major wirehouse is, is really because the conflicts of interest, number one, two, constant headline risk, where yeah. they would be doing something erroneous or egregious, would be in newspapers, I get calls from clients, et cetera, et cetera. So getting out of that world and, and, and also what people think about advisors really is not in such high regard. Yeah. And that always frustrated me and bothered me because I know the the passion about what I'm trying to achieve here for my clients, what I do for my clients, right, is is so paramount. And I always compare it to, you know, the three-legged stool where the three most important things in people's lives is number one, you have to have your health, right? If you have your health, two is your family. You can enjoy your family if you have your health, right? Yeah. And creating a stable family. And then three is money. Without money, you know, you can't really enjoy, you, you can't really enjoy your family the way you like to enjoy it. And, you know, when you have money, it does help, you know, most people who have money have the ability and access to great healthcare and, and do other things to really keep yourself healthy. So money is a really, is one of the, the three legs of a stool. So my job is so important in my clients' lives in directing them. And I manage the money on a discretionary basis. So it's not like I call them and say, hey, let's buy this, let's invest it. They depend on me to make those decisions for them. So, yeah. you know, for that reason, for that reason, you know, I wanted to set up a platform where my clients know anything I'm recommending to them, there are no conflicts like these yeah. large Wall Street firms, right? In other words, we don't have products to sell them. We don't make extra fee commissions on other products to sell them from other companies and yeah. or have analysts that recommend stocks based on um, based on banking deals that they have going on, right? Yeah. Which is, which is completely ridiculous, right? When you think about it totally. in the end. And I know this because I was there, Steve, for 20 years. And I've oh. been in, and they put me in rooms saying, why don't you sell clients more of this or sell clients more of that? I'm like, you know, these are people's life savings. And you're telling me this because you want to increase shareholder value as a publicly traded company. I have no interest in that. So it's creating this platform where people know when they come to me, their wall could come down. Let's just talk about like, what do you want out of life? What's your vision for your life, right? What is your number? You said it before. Yeah. That's what I said. What is your number? Is it 10,000 yeah. a month, 20,000, 50? What is that number? What are your assets? And going through risk and understanding everything. And then as their personal CFO, just helping them with everything as it relates to money. Because if something happens to them tomorrow and they die, you know, they know that, Call Phil, call Phil, call Phil. He'll take care of everything. And, you know, so. And when you succeed at doing that for, from a work vision, from a mission vision, from a helping these individuals, what does that do for your family? What does that do for your fulfillment? What does that do for your ability to have fun and enjoy your life? Like what, what is that outcome that you're living every day and that you're working towards? And, and what does that look and feel like? So, Stephen, I remember when I was in the business three years into the business, I was at Merrill Lynch and I was cold calling at the time. And fortunately, I got this new client, Mr. Takeda, 
owned business business owner in Queens over here, and and he became my client. He, he was doing it. He had a twenty five million dollar business. And when I became a client, we started to get to know each other. And I sat I sat down with him and I asked him a question. I said, Mr. Keita, I said, how did you, he was an Asian uh, immigrant, right? Mm-hmm. Super successful guy. I go, how did you become so successful? And he said, Phil, he goes, let me tell you. He goes, I had a passion for what I was, what I do, mm. right? I had a passion for importing goods, right? That he, that he was, uh, that he was doing. And that passion, money followed me. It wasn't the reverse. It wasn't like I was yeah. looking, I was following money. And then as a result, I started this, it was the opposite. He loved what he did. And as a result, money followed him. So to answer your yeah. question, I love what I do. I have a passion for what I do. Fortunately, it is a business where you, the economics are very beneficial. And those economics benefit my family from the standpoint that, you know, thank God we live in a, a great community, you know, great school district, which is most important when you're raising a family. You know, we live close to my mom and dad, my my mother-in-law and father-in-law, um, and we can do pretty much anything that we want to do. You know, and but yet we don't spoil our children, which we feel is really important. So, you know, that 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 that's how all of this. And you know, starting my own business, I parked my my firm seven minutes from my home. I have three yeah. boys, we're totally busy with sports and stuff like that. So I get to leave here and, and I'm home within seven minutes and and do whatever I want to do. So that's been a tremendous benefit of my career. I mean, it just sounds like such a beautiful life that you're creating mm-hmm. and you have so much control over that because you're a business owner, you're in that position, but you're also reinvesting into growing for an exit, right? Kind of the business you're building, although you want to pass it on from a legacy perspective, you're really building for an exit. So at some point in time in the future, you've got this 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 amount of money that you can live off of, or you can simply hand that over to somebody else in your family who keeps running it. And being clear on that upfront is really important because if you are building the business in order purely from an income standpoint, you'd build it differently than if you're building it for this legacy piece. And a lot of folks oftentimes aren't clear on that. So I think it's a great example about somebody like yourself who's building that for a purpose And everything else that you do is really connected to that purpose. And so when you are pulling money out of the business, when you are going about investing, you're somebody who has a special set of skills. I talk about the importance of investing with expert operators, expert investment advisors. Most people who try to get into stocks and do it themselves, they have really no idea what they're doing. And I honestly think the, the, the deck is stacked well against them because there's big fund managers who have way more information and their job is to be able to make a 10th of a percent. And that can be huge on billions of dollars. So talk to us a little bit about what type of investments you like, knowing that you're an expert and that you do this for people. And then what do you like about those different, different buckets that you can go about investing into? I tell you what I don't like. I hate that word stock, right? So th- yeah. what investors have to do is you have to be an investor, right? Investment and being an investor means, right? You're going to invest in stocks, but stocks are great businesses. You actually earn a piece of a business and that's how yeah. you should be looking at it, right? So Stephen, if you sold some a piece of real estate property for $3 million and you went down the road to buy the local candy store or or if you bought the car wash, Right, you took that three million dollars. You would buy that car wash. Now you own that business. There's cash flow of the business, and you only bought that business because there was cash flow that you understood, right? And, it, and there was high returns on investment capital when money was being reinvested into the business, right? And so that's what attracted you to buy that business. And that, and the cash flows you received from that business was greater than buying a ten year treasury bond. If it wasn't, you wouldn't have taken three million dollars and buying yeah. that that car wash, right? Well, that concept is the same thing when it goes to investing in stocks of great businesses. You should first understand the cash flows of the business, the returns on investment capital of the particular business, understand leadership. And the most important part, you have to really understand the product. Like if you buy Apple, like you understand Apple, they sell iPhones, iPads, Macs, and services. That's predominantly their business, right? Yeah. Like you can conceptually understand that. And you know, everybody around you has an iPhone. When you buy yeah. Nvidia, when you buy Nvidia, you don't really understand Nvidia. They make chips. They sell, but okay, who do they sell? What do they do? What does it do exactly? I get the J- Chat GBT yeah. thing, but you don't really understand it. But if you buy yeah. Coca Cola or American Express and Apple, like you understand it, and that helps you stay in the game. So when it comes to investing, you have to think of it as like now you own a piece of the business, 
Yeah. And because of that, their cash flows, you understand the cash flows, and you understand you did all your homework and understanding that. And then buy it today below its fair value, because every company has a fair value based on the future cash flows of that business discount until today. Yeah. Right. So now you have a value of the business. If it's trading below that value of your estimate, you buy it and you hold on to it for the next 20 years. Yeah. And don't care. And there's no reason to care about what the market's doing today, tomorrow, next three months, six months. If if you're wasting your time worrying about where the market's going tomorrow, you're wasting time investing, period. End of story. There's, you don't buy the market, you buy stocks of great businesses. And then you so, so you important the because you're a difference. Because you're really saying you're not a trader. You're you're kind of anti-trading. You're like, yeah, we're gonna make trades and make different investments and buy and sell these assets, but really you're looking at this business from a long-term perspective. You're a real estate guy. You're exactly right, right? Yeah. You trade real estate. I prefer not to. Right. Most likely you don't trade real estate. If yeah. the stock market goes down or if the economy goes into recession, recession, or if you're predicting that, do you sell your real estate properties? Uh, most of the time, no. <laughs> right. So you own your real estate because it shows it's proven great cash flow. And if you hold on to it for 20 years or greater, we know that the return on investment is very, very good. So th this is exactly how people should be thinking of it. No different than anything else, whether you're buying real estate or you own a business, it's the same exact concept. It changes the whole game when you think this way. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so intelligent to think about that. And, you know, I'm a guy who is very close to real estate. I'm much closer to private equity, individual businesses and being able to invest yeah. in those kind of opportunities. And I'm a big promoter of thinking of that as a phenomenal path towards creating income and long-term wealth gain and appreciation. Right. But I always think it's important to know what the trade-offs are because there is trade-offs when you go into something that's a publicly traded uh, equity versus getting into something that's private. And all of the investments that we do at Von Finch, when we're buying and selling real estate, these are all privately traded securities. So it's just like buying into a stock in the stock market, except the difference is you're typically invested for a longer period of time. Let's talk about some of the trade-offs. What's the upside of going into public equities versus what are some of the downsides of going into those type of assets? And what's the trade-off that you have to consider when you're going into privately held private equity? Uh, and how should we be thinking about that? Right, just to make sure it's clear, I love private equity, I love real estate, and I love public companies equally. Yeah, yes, okay. totally, totally. There's so, trade-offs in between them though. So the, the, the benefits of public companies are you, you could buy into a slice of a business and you don't have to worry about managing the business yep. or dealing with management or anything like that. It's very liquid, right? I go in today, I can go out tomorrow, not that you want to trade it, but it is very liquid. Yeah. You could diversify a little bit easier, right? I'd say those are the three benefits. And there's a selection of you know 100,000 publicly traded companies all around the world. Private businesses, so that's so that's the benefit. The negative is is really the emotional aspect. The, the biggest problem with with public stocks for investors, the worst thing in the world for their, for the for public investors is the internet. The ability to go into your account and trade, yeah. right? If you, I guarantee you, if Trump or other big real estate people in the world had the opportunity to trade their real estate investments daily, right, from nine thirty till four five days a week, I guarantee you they would not be a billionaire today. Yeah. I would guarantee you. It's the idea that you, it's not liquid. You're going to hold on to it for a long time. You got these cash flows. And that's why people succeed so much more in real estate than they do in public stocks. And the same thing I would argue with private businesses, right? Because they're not liquid. You hold on to it for a long term. And that's how you get return, great return on your investment. So those are the biggest differences, one versus the other. You can make great money in all three areas. Mm -hmm. Going back to you said before, being a trader, being a trader, understand the statistics behind that, 95% of people fail. So why would you want to do something where there's a 95% chance of you failing, number one? And who yeah. the heck wants to sit in front of a screen, 9.30 to, to, to 4? I, got, I know people that they go on vacations, they bring their laptops, and they're like sitting in front of a laptop and trading and not spending time with their family. Like, who wants to deal with that? So there are plenty of monies to build wealth over time. And the most successful, just look what the most successful people have done, you know, whether it's real estate, private businesses, public stocks, you know, it's long-term hold in those particular areas and buying good quality.
And that's really the investor mindset is realizing that you're not a trader. You're not looking to operate and run that business. You're looking right. to invest in it. So you want to invest in that business for the long term, whether that's publicly traded and there's a lot more information available and there is the liquidity of you being able to sell at any point in time. But the downside is if you're emotional, if you are doing that, if you are pulling the trigger and pulling out of something, it'd be just like real estate today. The stock market's down compared to what it was a year ago, give or take, depending on when we're listening to this. If you were to then exit the same private real estate in that type of market, fortunately, real estate doesn't trade often. So you don't have to sell it. But if people were doing that, it's exactly what you're talking about. There's that emotional piece. And when people are emotional, they make bad decisions. So I I 100% agree with you. I just don't have the experience on the public equity side to know and have that expertise to make those decisions. But that's what's so intelligent about the Warren Buffett model. He's believing the same thing that I believe. Buy for value, buy for cash flow, buy for the opportunity that there's going to be appreciation at some point in the future, but you're just buying a good business. Doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. It's just that in the future, it's going to be, you're going to be able to exit it for more. Thank you for listening to the Investor Mindset Podcast. If you like what you heard, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share with a friend. Head over to the InvestorMindset.com to join the Insider Club, where we share tools and strategies from the top investors and entrepreneurs on how to take it to the next level.